Thank you very much for the invitation, Puff, for being here and to talk to you for about 20 minutes about what I personally think is some trends when it comes to responsible gambling. And who am I to say something about that? Well, I have spent the last 30 years working with problem gambling and problem gamblers and their relatives and friends. I have spent more than 20 years in all kinds of cooperation with gaming operators, talk to regulators, talk to researchers around the world. Um, so I have a bit of an overview, I have a bit of, of information about what trends are going on. I know a bit of what gaming operators and regulators are thinking about. And I think I will share those ideas and thoughts with you that I have around that. Um, our friend from Estonia said, what is responsible gambling? Well, it's a good question. I am not always interested in semantics and what kind of semantics means. I know that responsible gambling is important because I s made a, a decision maybe 15, 20 years ago that if you want to know and meet gamblers, if you want to put a message out for gamblers, where should you put it? They don't read what the social welfare department talk about. They don't read what the psychologist in PTO speaks about. They are on the website, or they are at the gaming commissioner, they are at the retailer store, they are where the gambling is going on. And if it's possible to put messages out via operators to the gamblers, then you have gained some kind of knowledge, not some kind of, of advantage in, in that area. And that's, that's what I have been doing together with gaming operators, including Puff, for the last 15, 20 years. So that was a decision I made rather early and that I support, thought was really important. What has changed much, much of this is online. Gaming online have changed the landscape, not only of gambling, but also the landscape of what is responsible gambling and how should we work with responsible gambling to inform, to enlighten, to uh, offer gamblers some kind of, of effectiveness, some tools, some, something that can help them to keep their gambling under control. Not maybe fun, not maybe f not even interesting, but under control. So online and online games have changed a lot of things. And Online gambling is accessible, it's fast, it's fun, and it's risky. In Sweden, there is a longitudinal study going on in, uh, since 2007, isn't it, Jacob? Uh, and that's a really interesting study, uh, and if you're a bit interested in, in what problem gambling is, what, what kind of prevalence rates we are talking about, what kind of people get problems with gambling, how they come in and out from ga problem gambling, and so on. This is a really interesting study. And lots of material is actually written in, in English. And uh, to try to give some kind of hint about what is happening when it comes to prevalence rates and the risks of gambling, this is an odds ratio uh, table that was constructed. So, internet, all kinds of games on internet is more risky than any other form of gambling you can think of. No matter if you put bingo or lotto or whatever on the internet, the risks of having problems with gambling increase. But the table is interesting because uh, the, 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 the number three is actually more than a sum. So if you gamble also on VLT, you have to do three equals 2.5, so 7%. The, the inc risk increased seven times. So the more games you gamble on, the higher is the risk to have problems with gambling. And that means th that's, th that's that the sums are more than the parts. So the more games you gamble on, the, the higher is the risk that you have problems with gambling. And that's something that should be considered and thought about when we talk about regulations, when we talk about limit setting, when we talk about uh, self-exclusion and so on. This is something you need to bear in mind. The risks increase the more uh, games you, you gamble. When I talk to media a lot, they say, well, 
there has to be an increase in prevalence. We are, there are so much gambling going on. There's so much, much commercials going on about gambling. So problem gamblers must increase, and you must have a lot of to do, Thomas. Well, fact is, when you look on research done on prevalence rates over the world, not in all parts of the world, but the Western world, the prevalence rate actually goes down or stays on the same level as it usually has to be. Around 1 to 3% of the population have cut some kind of forms of problem gambling. So that's the general trend. Problem gambling and problem gamblers is decreasing and also stays on the same level, despite the accessibility of games, despite games on the internet, despite all the commercials, this is what's going on. But it's not the whole truth. When you dig into these figures, you find immediately find that what, what is actually increasing is the number of players having problem with gambling on the internet. So there is a shift from physical games on for, or, or casino games online and all kinds that you do on uh, live in all kinds of facilities towards internet. What also happens when you dig into this figure is that the, the average age of those who have problems with gambling decrease. And the speed of them getting problems, severe negative consequences from gambling with, with all kinds of things like economics, psychological, social, workplace, is going fast and things are happening quick for them. So the negative consequences for that particular group of, of players that get problems on the internet, the, the career, so to speak, going from being some kind of normal player to having uh, disasters from, from gambling is quicker than before. So internet is fast, it's fun, it's accessible, but it's risky. So what kind of trends when it comes to responsible gambling despite all that goes on with technology and the things with the prevalence rate and that the, 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 the part of the population that gamble actually decrease. And as someone told this morning, the, the average age of all the gamblers goes up. That's, that's also trends, that young people actually leave gambling and, and they probably go on gaming instead. They do something else than gambling. But when it comes to responsible gambling, there are trends as well. Trends that has been like bubbling in a, in a champagne bottle and suddenly things have exploded. What has happened and what has been done is that all things about smart limiting setting have changed. A couple of years ago everything was fixed. You have to do this, you have to do that. Today limiting setting is much more individualized. The player can choose themselves what kind of limit they would like to have with time, with money, with self-exclusion. So the options for the player gets more and more uh, broadened and they can find things that they actually like them themselves. The communication with the players has increased dramatically from being hardly anything where the operator actually proactively communicated with the player. There has been a dramatic shift in that. Today, most of the operators try to communicate in one way or in ma many ways from themselves to the player with all kinds of information about the risks of gambling for, you know, in a general way, but also communicating what they see about your own personal behavior. There is also an increase in all kinds of self-assessment and self-help tools online. So today you can find self-assessment screening instruments on ev almost every gaming operator's site. And that those self-assessment tests all in some kind or in one way or another relates to giving you some kind of information where you can find help, how this series of problem is, and so on. What is also is, is uh, going on is uh, that many operators today have some kind of behavior tracking system. 
and they use the big data that they have collecting about their, their players. They also use that big database to actually try to spot risky behavior among players and try to find out before the player even recognizes it themselves that you might have a problem in the future if you continue to game, gamble in this way. Uh, lots of operators has that kind of, of behavior tracking systems today and I think it is really interesting to see what is going to happen on that route. What has also have happened is that the training that the, uh, the regulators talked about be before the break, that staff training is a part of, of the license or some kind of a part of the license that, that, that the operator have, that training has been ongoing for many, many years. Staff training has been an, uh, an issue for many years among operators. But what has happened the last years is that the operator starts to specialize the training depending on what kind of role you have in the, in, in, in the, opera in, in the company. If you are uh, working with marketing, you need to have special skills about marketing and the consequences of marketing, etc., etc. So the training has gone from being very general to being more and more specific, on depending on what kind of role you have among the operators. These are five general res gaming responsible trends that is going on currently around the world. And many operators doesn't talk about it loudly, they just do it. So it, it's, not, it's not always so easy to find out what they are doing and how they do it. Uh, sometimes they share, but not always. Um, do we know today if anything of these responsible gaming tools that operators are using, do we know that they actually work? Well, a bit, bits and pieces of that. And that's, that's why I'm happy to see that Per and Per is going to do some research together with Puff. What is working? How does it work? For whom does it work? We, we know that, that some things work a little bit better than, than other things. We know that policy initiatives is really, really important. Things like age, age limitation, like uh, restricting the number of gambling uh, venues, restricting use of alcohol when gambling. We know that those are policies that not the operators themselves decide on, but we know that that kind of enforced policies have a huge impact on how many people have problems with, 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 uh, with gambling. Among the, the responsible gaming initiatives that operators use, we know that, that different kinds of, of uh, maximum loss limits has an effect. Some countries, like Norway, they today talk about imposing a maximum limit of how much money you can use per week, per month, playing on Norsk Tipping's website. No matter what kind of game, there is, will be a general roof on how much money you can lose on Norsk Tipping's website. I don't know if they are the first operator that actually do, talks about it, but I hear, hear a lot of operators saying pretty much the same thing. Is it possible to put a, a general limit on this? I hear regulators talk about it, but Norsk Tipping is actually working on putting up a su such a limit that you can't lose more than X amount of Norwegian kronos per month. We know that the, the accessibility or how much money you can transfer to your player account also have, have an impact. So the, the more difficult you make it for people to actually uh, transfer money to their gambling account, the better it is from that, uh, that perspective. We know that these voluntary limits when people set t uh, limits for time and money also works. It seems that when people are informed before they gamble, pre-gambling, uh, that when they decide what kind of time and how much money they are prepared to lose on gambling, they actually stick to those rules. And we know the self-exclusion works as well. Self-exclusion is an option for many to actually stop, stop for a couple of hours or a couple of days, but for many self-exclusion is a way to get into treatment. 
They use self-exclusion as a way to finally make a decision to go to treatment. They can have, they can have done five, six, seven self-exclusions periods before they, they at the eighth time they self-exclude, they, they actually go to treatment. Uh, Self-exclusion is also used by people who are in treatment to prevent themselves from, from to going back and have relapse from gambling. And that's why I think though that the, the, the issue about having some kind of general self-exclusion system in, in a jurisdiction is a really good idea. If you want to exclude from all kinds of gambling, press one button and you are self-excluded for all the, the illegal gaming operators that are, are working in that country. Uh, and I think that's also a trend that lots of, of jurisdictions talk about building up uh, a, a common self-exclusion register. Here is a really nice picture. You will find it in, uh, I think it's Williams et al. that has done this. I think it's hard to see actually, but you can get the picture afterwards. That they have listed all kinds of, of self-imposed uh, or uh, re, um, responsible gambling measures that actually have some kind of, of academical and research impact and seems to work. So you can go back. It was bad. We have black current there. Uh, so some of, of these things actually works depending on where you impose them and depending on how you do it because it seems that execution is everything. Like uh, this lady in the morning Sille talked about. It has to do with how you, how you do it. So if you, are, if you would like to help people self-exclude well you can put a, put a small little sign on that you can self-exclude and no one will find it. But you can also promote self-exclusion as a way, and then suddenly things happen. So depending on how you, how you do it, you can actually do it better or, or worse. But there are evidence that responsible gambling actually work, that responsible gambling has an effect on, on people's habits on, or when it comes to gambling, but also on how they seek help when they need it and then when they have problems with gambling. I think I talked a bit about that. I, I don't like talk to overhead slides because my brain doesn't work liner. It works in a different way. But there are lots of nice things going on in a couple of jurisdictions around the world where operators are actually trying to see what is what is possible to do to help people to keep themselves in, in the limit. And I think that one of the most interesting things has to do with being proactive as an operator to your customer. To use your behavioral tracking system or any other system to actually actively contact players that you think have a problems or that you know have problems with gambling. Approach them and talk to them and offer them help. Offer them the, the, the support to seek help, to decrease their gambling, to use responsible gambling uh, um, measures within the operators. And I think that's a really interesting trend that is going on. Uh, and I think, actually I think it's no way going back. I think there's no way going back for gaming operators today and regulators and owners of gaming operators and gaming companies to go back. Today, most much game goes on online and there will be more games online. Lots of people use cards, loyalty cards or obligatory cards to before you, you can gamble. And that means that you as an operator actually knows what is going on. You can't say anymore, we didn't know. We couldn't do anything because we didn't know. You know. You know where they live. You know how much they gamble, what type of gamble they like, when they gamble, how they gamble, how much they win, how much they lose. You know everything. And there's no way back. That information should also be used to be proactive against the gambling, uh, the gambling customers.
I think I see some challenges with responsible gambling and the discussion that goes on with uh, responsible gambling. I fear a route that gambling and gambling problems will be individualized. We have so many tools, we have so much knowledge, we have given you all the information, it's your decision if you are gambling or not, and that's true. But it's also your fault if you have problems with gambling. We are not in charge anymore. And I fear that it could be we could l end up in a discussion where regulators, politicians and gaming operators says, well, we have done what we have, what we can. We can't do anything more. Sorry. I fear that licensing demands could be a roof instead of a floor. I haven't met any gaming operator that doesn't follow the license that they have. They do it 24 hours a day. Or at least they try to be as good as they can to actually do it. But I, I think that to be, as, as a regulator, as a politician, to be too precise on what gaming operators should do also means that that is what they are going to do and no more. So why should we introduce research on what kind of communication we should have with our players if the regulators say something different? I think, as I said before, responsible gambling is like Sale talked this Sally 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 Sille talked about this morning. It's about the execution. The smarter you are, the better it is. It's not anymore about inventing something new. It's about doing it in a smarter way. I think also think that we sometimes listen too much to all things that comes from an audience that talks about Big Brother. Big Brother is deciding. Big Brother is, is saying that we should do this and should do that. I don't like it. It's a small minority of, of players and in the community that is have that kind of view. And I think those that group of people, we will never be able to satisfy them. They will always be there. And when we look on responsible gambling and how responsible gambling is introduced, if you ask the players before you introduce something, they usually are a bit negative, skeptic. They don't, they don't understand why, because I don't need it. But maybe my neighbor needs it, but I don't need it. But if you actually do it, and you put it up, and you introduce it, hands off, people like it, if you have done it in a rather smart way. And as long as you don't point the finger, and you put shame and guilt on the players, they say, this is okay, thank you. So it's, it's more about that, and I will stop now. Thank you very much for, the, for your time. Okay, a big hand to Thomas. <laughs>